Okay. Um, I too want to extend my, my thanks and my gratitude to the culture um, and everyone associated with the tuning speculation uh, symposia, as I call them, uh, <laughs> drinking parties, um, <laughs> which uh, actually have had a huge impact on the nature of my own professional research and scholarly life. Uh, I don't think you guys know just how much uh, being here in these last few years has done to change what I focus on, both in my teaching and in my research. Um, and so I want to thank you all for that. It's really been very important to me, and I hope it continues forever and ever. Um, <laughs> that said, I'm going to take us back to something very old-fashioned today, um, which is maybe where I always am. And uh, so here goes. Uh, this, I do have a sort of bad PowerPoint presentation, and then in the middle of it, I'm going to have to switch to like make a little musical sound. Um, so it's it's a sort of 1980s uh, attempt to talk about <laughs> the 1950s and 60s, and forgive me, but that's you know, kind of where I am. Uh, the talk's called Decomposition and Simultaneity, New Prospects for an Old Avant-Garde. In each of my contributions to the Tuning Speculation Symposia, I've taken my bearings from the last essay written by Gilles Deleuze, where he opens up the possibility of a radically imminent approach to philosophical research. What is a transcendental field, he asks. It can be distinguished from experience in that it doesn't refer to an object or belong to a subject empirical representation. It appears, therefore, as a pure stream of asubjective consciousness, a pre-reflexive impersonal consciousness, a qualitative duration of consciousness without a self. It may seem curious that the transcendental be defined by such immediate givens. We will speak of a transcendental empiricism in contrast to everything that makes up the world of the subject and the object. That's an unquote. Characterizing both the object and subject as transcendent, Deleuze goes on to insist, quote, the transcendent is not the transcendental, just like Kant. Were it not for consciousness, the transcendental field would be defined as a pure plane of immanence, because it eludes all transcendence of the subject and of the object. Absolute immanence is in itself. It is not in something to something. It does not depend on an object or belong to a subject." Unquote. That there might be ways to construe philosophical work otherwise than is rooted in the human subject, otherwise than is transcendent to the field of its object, otherwise than is obsessed with symbolic systems distanced from the real, these are the stakes of the wager that Deleuze makes in this provocative text. Today, I'd like to follow yet another path through this plane of eminence, taking my start from Andrew Culp's recent remark that ours is an age of obligatory positivity, distributed management, and stifling transparency. I think much of this weekend we've been talking about these issues in one way or another. Believing that the only aesthetic political response to such an age involves a questioning of all the binaries that might be generated around concepts of use and intelligibility, I want to suggest that there's still much to learn from the aesthetic politics of the 1950s and 1960s. Indeed, I want to insist that a broadly Deleuzean philosophical perspective requires that we give up any transcendental sense that our aesthetics politics today has progressed beyond the theory and practice of previous avant-gardes. To this end, I'd like to put into dialogue the situationist platform, I told you I was going back, the situationist platform of Guy Debord, 1931 to 1994, and the poetic, musical, and performance practices of Jackson McClough, 1922 to 2004. De Boer is someone who seems never quite to go out of fashion, although his work seems never to be taken all that seriously. Uh, McClough, in contrast, may no longer even be a familiar name, except to those with an interest in language poetry, or those devoted to the circle of artists, musicians, and writers working in direct relation with John Cage. With the passage of historical time, the ideologies governing these avant-garde strategies, De Boer's Lukash inflected Marxism, McClough's Taoist-inflected Zen Buddhism fade in importance, while their actual political aesthetic practices remain exemplary and relevant to our own age. 
Freed from the dual constraints of intellectual coherence and political utility, these icons of a nearly lost avant-garde can be seen to offer us paths towards thoughtful experience that bypass recuperation by late capitalism. Now watch this. <laughs> I thought the pixelation was kind of perfect. In the founding documents of Situationism, Du Bois contrasts his project with what he calls the decomposition of bourgeois culture represented by futurism, Dadaism, and Surrealism. As much as these avant-garde movements rattled the settled expectations of bourgeois consumers, they actually reinforced what we might call the transcendental presumptions of aesthetics. In the Theses on Cultural Revolution, 1958, Du Bois writes, the traditional goal of aesthetics is to make one feel, in privation and absence, certain past elements of life that through the mediation of art would escape the confusion of appearances, since appearance is what suffers from the reign of time. The degree of aesthetic success is thus measured by a beauty inseparable from duration, intending even to lay claim to eternity. In contrast, De Boer describes situation situationism in the following terms, quote, the situationist goal is immediate participation in a passionate abundance of life through the variation of fleeting moments resolutely arranged. The success of these moments can only be their passing effect, unquote. It follows that, quote, art can cease to be a report on sensations and become a direct organization of higher sensations. It's a matter of producing ourselves and not things that enslave us, unquote. What is at stake then is what De Boer describes as a new, quote, freedom in the employment of time, a freedom made possible only through the construction of situations. The temporal structures of this new kind of freedom are elaborated in De Boer's report on the construction of situations, 1957, probably the most important document of the Situationist International, where he sketches most of the practices that have come to define situations. Key to his vision is the construction of situations, that is, the concrete construction of temporary settings of life and their transformations into a higher passionate nature. I would stress here that the construction of situations is simultaneously a matter of objective recreation of the human environment and subjective transformation in and by that environment. Object and subject remain paired in the plane of eminence, and De Boer goes out of his way to stress the ephemerality of situationism's techniques and constructions. He writes, we have to organize games of these poetic subjects among these poetic objects. That's our entire program, which is essentially ephemeral. Our situations will be without a future. There'll be places where people are constantly coming and going. The unchanging nature of art, or of anything else, does not enter into our considerations, which are in earnest. The idea of eternity is the basest one a person could conceive of regarding his or her acts." Unquote. Situations are constructed, then, with the aim of transforming the human world in all its aspects. What alters the way we see the streets is more important than what alters the way we see painting, De Boer insists. In this sense, it's not a question of knowing whether this interests you, but rather of whether you yourself could become interesting under new conditions of cultural creation. <laughs> the report famously insists upon a unitary urbanism, about which much has been written, that's focused on the dynamic interpenetration of lived spaces and affective states of mind. Such interpenetration is made possible by the detournement of all existing forms of art and urban planning, and by the practice of the derive, which De Boer defines as a passionate uprooting through the hurried change of environments. In short, situationism amounts to the invention of a new species of games, and its most general aim must quote, be to broaden the non-mediocre portion of life, to reduce its empty moments as much as possible. The time of our lives is radically non-continuous, and the construction of situations is meant to facilitate our celebration of this fact. Life's chief emotional drama, De Boer writes, after the never-ending conflict between desire and reality hostile to that desire, certainly appears to be the sensation of time's passage. 
The situationist attitude consists in counting on time's swift passing, unlike aesthetic processes which aim at the fixing of emotion. The situationist challenge to the passage of emotions and of time will be its wager on always gaining ground on change, on always going further in play, and in the multiplication of moving periods. Obviously, it's not easy for us at this time to make such a wager. However, even were we to lose it a thousand times, there is no other progressive attitude to adopt." Unquote. In place of the daily grind of empty work and enforced recreation, situationism envisions a passionate life of swift and constant change, of joyously playing a series of games, the rules of which are ever-changing, and of inventively sidestepping all expectations and demands of the instrumentality of late capitalism. In these respects, then, there may even be a family resemblance between divorce practice and the decelerationist aesthetics of Catherine Bihar. I'd like to turn now to the work of the American avant-garde poet and composer Jackson McClough, equally great picture of Jackson. <laughs> 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 it was popular at the time. It was popular at the time. Uh, <clears throat> McClough is perhaps best known today, if he's known at all, as one of the first exponents of what came to be called language poetry in the 1970s, but this characterization fails to do justice to the extraordinary diversity of his creative output. While most of his work has some basis in language, it takes the form of discrete poems, vast series of interwoven texts, plays, dance pieces, radio plays, and musical compositions. Working in parallel with his friend John Cage, McClough began pushing the possibilities of radical indeterminacy in text-derived pieces during the 1950s. He actually said he started doing this in the 1930s, but certainly by the 1950s, it was his primary practice. And Cage regularly insisted on the importance of McClough's example as he himself turned more fully to text-based composition in the 1970s and 1980s. Closely associated with the living theater and with Fluxus, McClough was co-editor with Lamont Young of the perennially influential volume An Anthology, probably the most important Fluxus publication of the 60s. Throughout his five-decade career, McClough explored in a number of different ways a particular performance genre that he called the simultaneity. The simultaneity is a composition incorporating words, music, and even visual elements, which is meant to be performed by groups of indeterminate size, each performance of which is unique because of real-time chance systems incorporated into the performing methods and because of spontaneous choices made by the performers during the performance. I want to share with you a couple of minutes of a simultaneity from the spring of 1976 called Homage to Leona Bleibeis. And there's the score. Uh, McClough offers the following almost pataphysical account and description of the piece. This, by the way, is a photograph taken by my iPhone of the uh, liner notes of the cassette recording of this, this piece, uh, and taken in Delphi, Greece, just last week. I thought it was appropriate to bring the present into the past and the past into the present. For many years, Leona Bleibeis has published a word game in the New York Post called Word Power. In each day's column, she gives a word and its definition and the rules of the game. Quote, from the above word or phrase, make as many five-letter words as possible, using only one form of a word, for, an, for example, swing or swung, but not both. Don't make a word by adding S to a word of four letters. Slang, proper names, foreign words, not allowed. That's the end of the rules. And Jackson goes on, this game has been a great inspiration to me, though I've often violated her rules. Each section of this work is derived from one of her solution lists. And so here we have the word sluggishness and some five-letter words. The note groups are generated by substituting the proper notes for letters that are English or German pitch names and substituting notes whose pitch names aren't in the word for other letters, doing so by chance operations or arbitrarily. 
materials. Each performer is provided with the score of each section played, a page with a list of words from word power column, together with the note groups corresponding to the words, and a deck of playing cards. Each player's part consists of alternate segments of silence and of improvisation. Using only the notes of the note groups and the spoken words, both are regulated by the playing cards. Okay, so here's a brief excerpt from uh, quite a long recording, a recording that's about 100 minutes long, of the homage performed by McClough himself on piano and voice and Pauline Oliveros on accordion and voice. And the recording is from a 1977 two cassette release in the New Wilderness Audiographic series, itself a good example of an old avant garde recently made available um, digitally. And so now I go into a whole other. listen to a couple of minutes of the homage. <laughs> I hope you all have a sense of how the piece would continue to unfold, and I trust you're also feeling just a hint of nostalgia for avant-garde's of yesteryear. <laughs> uh, despite the sheer abundance of his writing, McClough himself rarely wrote about the philosophical foundations of his aesthetic practice. The best source of this sort is, in fact, a talk he gave at the Naropa Institute in July of 1975 with the sober title, The Poetics of Chance and the Politics of Simultaneous Spontaneity, and the less than sober subtitle, The Sacred Heart of Jesus. <laughs> this talk is wide-ranging, <laughs> loosely organized meditation on McClough's writing and performance practice, three layers of which merit attention here. At one level, and this is perhaps the level of most relevance to his audience at Naropa, which as you know, was especially at that time, a highly experimental Buddhist college. McClough stresses the spiritual aspect of his practice, offering an account of his use of what he calls systematic chance, very much along the lines of John Cage's composition as process, Indeterminacy, from 1958. He writes, so the use of systematic chance is one way in which you can avoid making choices. And the reasons for this are involved with the illusoriness of the ego, and the wish to dissolve, or at least de-emphasize, the ego. Another way is for the composer of pieces for groups to make many choices available for performers within the piece. 
unquote. Noting that when you work this way, you realize that making a chant system is as egoic in some ways, or even as emotional as writing a poem spontaneously. McClough continues, but at the same time, you realize there is something more than just yourself doing it. And by interacting in that way with chance, or the world, or the environment, or other people, one sees and produces possibilities that one's habitual associations, what we usually draw on in the course of spontaneous or intuitive composition, would have precluded." Unquote. Performing and experiencing a simultaneity, then, can open up possibilities that break us free from habits, helping us to listen and to live in a world where ordinary expectations are regularly elided. Another level of a closed lecture emphasizes the ways in which his simultaneities both model and exemplify the pacifist anarchism to which he was committed throughout his life. What I mean by this, he clarifies, is that things could get done better in society without a coercive force pushing everybody around. In every governmentally organized society, there's always either an army or a police force or both somewhere, if only in the background. But I really think that people can freely act together in sane ways, relatively spontaneously, as long as they're aware. And I think that this is the political side of Buddhist dharma. Gradually, McClough continues, while doing public performances in the 60s, I came more and more to realize the degree to which this kind of performance was a model for a free anarchist society, unquote. To those who insist that anarchism is utopian and impractical, McClough's body of work offers a host of opportunities to give anarchism a chance. <laughs> Finally, the Poetics of Chance quite straightforwardly suggests <laughs> that simultane simultaneities are to be understood as situations. The performance text, McClough says, is analogous to a given situation. For instance, that people must build a bridge to cross a certain river. In an anarchist society, one would find whoever in the community is best at building bridges and planning structures, civil engineers, and so on, and certain of them would take over specific aspects of the given task. In performing a simultaneity, the given task, the analog of the building of the bridge, is that you are to make some kind of performance out of the materials and rules. Once you've decided to do this, you're asked to be as human and aware as possible and to embody this awareness in speech and musical sounds, and also to be as good as possible at doing this, especially to use all your powers, not simply to be a neutral cog in something, not a robot. The performance piece is then a game of a very particular sort. These games I call pieces are non-competitive. With this, I trust you might now powerfully sense the family resemblance between the simultaneities of Jackson and McClough and the situations theorized by Guy Debord in the Situationist International. Where Debord stresses freedom and the employment of time, McClough encourage us, encourages us to dissolve the ego, thereby freeing us from dead routines of habitual association. In the experience of the simultaneity, one finds joy in non-competitive games where the rules are themselves open to anarchic modification and the participants are actively engaged in the transformation of an old world into something new. In both de Boer's situations and McClough's simultaneities, late capitalism's demands for intelligibility and utility are passionately ignored, with the result that something impossibly imminent streaks across Deleuze's transcendental field, never to be recuperated. In this way, the old avant-gardes of a past almost lost serve even today as powerful reminders of the possibility of a truly resistant aesthetic political project. Thanks a lot.